welcome. Thanks for joining us this evening to learn more about our reimagining Chesterfield effort, to share your thoughts, and most importantly, to hear and see a presentation from Ed McMahon. So I'm Katie Parks, I'm the director of the Center for Towns at the Eastern Shore Land Conservancy, and many of you may be familiar with the work that ESLC has done in um, rooted in conservation. We've preserved over 58,000 acres in the mid and upper shore counties on Maryland's Eastern Shore over the last 25 years. But as an organization, we're committed to preserving and sustaining the vibrant communities and the lands and waters that connect them with a focus on land, towns, and people. So from our lens of growing strong, vibrant, well-defined towns, we see Chesterfield as one of the most important opportunities for Centerville. Over the next few months, we'll work with the community on a visioning process to discuss, to discuss what the future use of Chesterfield and how it can allow for protection of the natural resources while supporting development that's consistent with the scale, pace, and character of Centerville. In addition to public input received, we will work with design and planning professionals to generate ideas and innovative uses to design a valuable asset for the entire Centerville community. To learn more about engagement opportunities, please share your contact information at the sign-in table, and we will be sending out project updates and opportunities with more meetings. We also maintain a blog on our website, and you can share your input on the website or also sign up to receive updates. I want to take a moment to recognize the elected officials joining us this evening. We have Town Councilman Tim McClus McCluskey, sorry, <laughs> Councilman Jim Beecham, and we have former Town Councilman Mike Whitehill and former Queen Anne's County Commissioner Bob Simmons. So thank you for joining us. So before we dive into our agenda, I've asked Town Council Vice President Tim McCluskey to say a few words regarding the town's traditional neighborhood development zoning, as well as the process that they've gone through with the proposed plan from the existing owner. Thanks, Katie. Uh, as as uh, Katie had said, I'm Tim McCluskey. I'm the Vice President of the Town Council. I've been on the council here for, for nine years now, and I agree that this is a very, very important piece of property. In, in fact, probably one of the most important pieces. You know, in, in 1782, I just want, I'm, I'm here to talk about a couple of things, right? I want just a very, very quick history on where, where uh, Chesterfield came from, and then talk about the, the steps that we've taken so far to get to where we are. So 1782, uh, our new country, uh, they, they didn't want to have uh, the, the, the um, courthouse in Queenstown, they wanted to move it to Centerville, but like many government projects, it took about 10 years to come up with the money. So in 1792, the actual original land for the courthouse was purchased from the estate of the Nicholson family, which is where Chesterfield Homestead is now. In 1794, another couple of years, the courthouse actually was started, and the first commissioners of Centerville, who were actually appointed by the state legislature, laid out 37 plots of land up and down uh, Liberty and Commerce Street as the first pieces of property here in Centerville. Fast forward 222 years. What comes around goes around. Just today, the county commissioners approved the building of a new circuit courthouse. That's been in the process for over 10 years. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a new development that's going to go in right uh, you know across the street from the existing uh, courthouse. And now we're talking about further development or the right type of development for the Chesterfield parcel that's remaining. Uh, the four things that I want to talk about are, are we have spent a considerable amount of time here in the town, as well as with the Planning Commission, uh, talking about TND design, traditional neighborhood design, going through a, a concept site plan for what the original contract purchaser wanted to envision on this property. Uh, getting critical area approval, right? This is on the waterfront. It's, it's very uh, environmentally sensitive. And so there's another layer uh, within the state that we had to go through. And then coming up with an agreement between the developer and the town that we call a developer's rights and responsibilities. So the, the comp plan, which was basically our guiding document in 2009, called for this property to be designated zoning of TND. We didn't have TND zoning at the time. So it, it specifically said, and I think this is a great quote, any future development of the property presents a unique opportunity for replicating historic land patterns found within the town of Centerville while preserving a special piece of town history. 
So T and D zoning traditionally is going to be higher density than a, a McMansion type subdivision. Okay, it's going to also have many different types of uh, of uses: single family, detached, townhomes, multifamily. Sometimes there's a retail or a business component as well. And it envisions really a traditional neighborhood. When, when I think of a traditional neighborhood, it's smaller front lawns. It's going to be porches where people can see each other and talk to each other. Um, these historically have been organically grown. If you look, a great example of a TND is downtown Centerville. Big houses next to small houses, apartments next to businesses. So they had traditionally originally uh, organically grown. Now they're being planned. Um, it has uh, an overarching sense of community, right? walkable uh, public gathering places. So in 2013, the contract purchasers came to the town and said they wanted to develop the property. Uh, the planning commission then spent the better part of 2013 through a monthly meeting process coming up with the language for the TND to go into the zoning code. Uh, the council eventually passed this, uh, this ordinance in 2014. We then also had to modify the official zoning map. There's a map in town that is the official zoning map, and so we had to go through an entire public process to make that happen as well. So then we have talked about the critical area. As I said, this is in a, a, an environmentally sensitive property. This, uh, this land is actually designated as uh, LDA, limited development uh, area. So that means that you can only have about 15% of impervious surface. And if you're going to look at a development, 15% is probably less than just putting the roads down. So virtually they could do nothing without getting that, that uh, designation transferred to an intensely developed area, IDA. So that would require a critical area commission review and approval. That's something that the town would have to actually ask for. So we spent a good amount of time talking with the developer about what are, some of their, what are some of the things that they want to do, and then what are some of the things that the town wanted to do. So the process included uh, an outline of what we would call a developer's rights and responsibilities agreements. Okay, so a developer's rights and responsibilities agreements is something that says we're going to promise, the town is going to promise that we're going to leave the zoning the way it is so that you can actually develop the project throughout the term of it. But also, we're going to make sure and we're going to hold you legally responsible for doing certain things. So things like um, the amount of open space, stormwater management and mitigation, public access, preserving the original Carter home. Um, we did finally get the critical area approval. The critical area approval is site specific. So it, it's based on the site that we came up with, uh, the, the concept plan that was presented, uh, and it's also based on the other things that we negotiated. So if this concept plan changes significantly, we're gonna have to go back and, and redo, uh, you know, re reapply for the critical area uh, designation, which is fine, it's just, a, just another process. So we've done several things so far to get to this stage, but by no means are we, are we done. Even if the property stayed the way it is and the development went forward as it was, there's not been any subdivision that's been done. We would need to finalize the site plan. We would actually need to ink and develop the full development rights and responsibilities agreement. So no matter what, what does happen, the town is, is very uh, linked to and, and, and joined uh, in making sure that this property really is, is developed uh, to its full potential. Um, Next, I, I want to introduce our main speaker for tonight, and, and it's really a small world. 20 years ago, I was living out in Colorado. My now wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, was working for a small land conservation company a business called the Conservation Fund. She was an office manager. I didn't really know anything about land planning at the time, but she worked for some of the folks who were conserving properties in western Colorado, and she had mentioned she had, had uh, talked to this guy named Ed McMahon, and he was in charge of the Virginia branch and he was just a visionary in terms of, of you know smart land use planning so here it is 20 years 20 years later uh, I'm the council member in a town and, and he's coming to talk about one of the most important properties that we're all interested in so Ed is a nationally known as an inspiring and thought-provoking speaker. He's a leading authority on topics such as the links between health and the built environment, sustainable development, land conservation, smart growth, and historic preservation. As the Senior Fellow for Sustainable Development, Ed McMahon leads the Urban Land Institute's worldwide efforts to conduct research and education activities 
related to environmentally sensitive development policies and practices. He's also a senior staff advisor for ULI's Building Healthy Places Initiative and is a sought after speaker and thinker on health and real estate. Ed McMahon holds the Charles E. Frazier Chair on Sustainable Development and Environmental P Policy at ULI in Washington, D.C. Ed, welcome. Thank you, Tim, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be back in uh, Centerville. I've been here a few times before. Uh, so I'm going to just tell you a little uh, story about how I got interested in what I'm going to talk about tonight. What I'm going to talk about is uh, economic and community development and trends in land use and community design. And the way I got interested in this is goes back a very long way. So 1970, I am a young second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. I had just finished field artillery school and jungle warfare training, and I had orders to a small fire base in the central highlands of Vietnam. And literally one week before I'm supposed to go, I get a call from the Pentagon, and I have a colonel on the other end of the line, and he's with the personnel division, and he says to me, Lieutenant McMahon, do you have any interest in being reassigned to Europe? And I'm like, okay, <laughs> let me think about that. I said, yes, Europe sounds very exciting. I would love to go to Europe. And uh, I got extraordinarily lucky. I was sent to Heidelberg, West Germany, uh, which is the headquarters for the US military in Europe and also one of the most beautiful small cities on the planet Earth. And I was assigned as an aide to a United States general and then I spent the next two and a half years of my life flying all over Europe in a helicopter. And that experience completely and totally changed my life. But of course, I didn't realize how much it would change my life till I flew home to Birmingham, Alabama, where I grew up, and I got out of the airplane and drove home, and for the first time ever, I saw the American landscape with a completely different set of eyes. Because, ladies and gentlemen, to travel is to learn. And that's what we try to do at the Urban Land Institute, is to learn from each other and from what's going on around our country and around the world, and what's working and what's not working in land development and design and so forth. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what I've learned in this area. So first, let's just talk about you for a second. So the, you live in a very special part of the world. The Eastern Shore is a great region with great people, great history, and great assets. And despite my misspelling of the word Centerville, uh, I think you live in a very special place. And I think most of you would probably agree that you live in a special place. But I want to tell you something, there is no place in America today that will stay special by accident. There is no place that will stay special by accident. And that's because the world is changing whether you like it or not. It is changing all around you, but there is only two kinds of change. There is planned change and there is unplanned change. You can anticipate the changes are coming, you can prepare for them, you can direct them, and you can shape them in a way that you like, or you can just let them happen. And that's what too many American communities have done. You know, the best way to shape the future is to create it yourself. So I want you to think about two questions tonight. First is a sort of a global question. Do you think that the character of the Eastern Shore should shape the new development, or you think the new development should shape and change the character of the Eastern Shore? And how you answer that question will determine what kind of community this is in the future. And I want you to think about another question as well. Should the Carter Farm, which is the subject of tonight's workshop, be just another suburban style development, or should be a special place that reflects the unique historic character of Centerville that Tim has already talked about. You know, you can grow by choice or you can grow by chance. You can shape the future you want or you can accept the future you are given. Those are your two choices. So, you know, let's talk about growth. Growth is about choices. You know, do you want to see more development in the downtown or do you want to see more development out on the highway? And by the way, I really don't think that happy face makes that better. 
You know, so, and let's also think about another choice. Do you think we should just spread out all over the eastern shore? You know, you know what a zoning ordinance is? It's just simply a blueprint for carving up every inch of land into house lots and streets, unless you do something differently. Unless you, do, so if you do nothing, every inch of land on the eastern shore could become just house lots and streets. And so often I hear people, like, you know, they used to say out in Loudoun County, Virginia, don't fair fax Loudoun. That was their th slogan. But of course, they didn't do anything at all to prevent Loudoun to become just like Fairfax. So I know people over here say, I don't want to be like the Western Shore, but you'll be just like the Western Shore unless you affirmatively choose to do something different. Because you have no control over all of the changes that I'm going to talk about in a second. So what else is growth about? It's about our children. It's about our grandchildren. It's about the future. And it's about preparing for the future. It's also about balance between jobs and the environment, conservation and economic development, the built environment, the natural environment. It's also about finding win-win solutions to the problems that face us today. I'm one of these people who think we spend way too much time in America fighting about what we disagree about, and not nearly enough time sitting down community by community to talk about what we do agree about. And what you find is when you sit down together, break bread together, talk to your neighbors, most people actually agree about lots of things. But I've also learned there's only one place in America nobody ever listens to anybody else. It's called a public hearing. <laughs> people come with their minds made up and they just talk right past each other. So you have to have a forum for dialogue about the future that is outside of that. So let's, you know, somebody, you know, Tim said I... I work on sustainable development. People are always asking me, what is sustainable development? Well, if you look up the word sustainable in the dictionary, it will tell you it means enduring. A sustainable community, ladies and gentlemen, is a place of enduring value. You know, in ancient Athens, the city leaders there used to take an oath of office to leave that great city, not less, but greater, more beautiful, and prosperous than it was left to them and I think that's your challenge as well. How do you leave Centerville, Maryland, not less, but greater, more beautiful and prosperous than it was left to you? So let's talk about some of those changes, some things that you have no control over. Yeah, the global and national economy is changing. Demographics is changing. Technology is changing. Consumer attitudes are changing. Healthcare is changing. Energy sources are changing, transportation options. Did you know what the fastest growing form of transportation in America today, nothing else is even close, it's called bicycling. By far, growing faster than anything else. You know, the weather is changing. You can either ignore that fact, or you could prepare for the, the changes that are coming. I'll just give you one example of that, you know, Pepco, has uh, for years they used to tell us that they couldn't afford to underground utility wires. Well, you know, two and a half years ago they decided to set aside one billion dollars for the systematic undergrounding of utility wires in the Washington metro area because they've decided they can't afford not to underground utility wires because extreme weather events are coming more frequently. The power is staying out longer. The economic losses are mounting just one of the changes occurring in the world we live in. So let's talk about employment. Yes, manufacturing is down everywhere in America, but business and professional services are up and education and medicine is up even more. Did you know that today in 62 of the 100 biggest cities in the United States, the biggest employer is a hospital or a university? So what's the biggest employer in Maryland? It's John Hopkins University in Baltimore, number one. And you know, Let's talk about how the crash is reshaping the American landscape. And some of you have heard of Richard Florida. He wrote a book called The Creative Class. He has a new book out called The Great Reset. And he says how we live, work, and shop and move around is going to change. And communities that embrace the future will prosper. Those that do not will decline. You know, and there's a big sort going on in America. When I got out of college, college graduates were evenly distributed throughout the United States by, based on population density. We had pretty much the same 
percentage of college graduates everywhere. And you know, talent would follow jobs. Today it's no longer true. Today college graduates are clustering in a few major metropolitan areas and a few cool small towns. And today jobs are following talent. Did you know that more than 500 major American communities have moved back from suburban office parks back into downtown in just the past five years? Did you know that just yesterday, the McDonald's Corporation announced they're moving from a suburban office park in Oak Park, Illinois, uh, Oak Brook, Illinois, back into downtown Chicago? Marriott's been in an office park outside of Washington for 40 years. They're moving back into the city to be on the metro. And why are all these companies moving? to attract and retain talented workers. Because young people, as it turns out, want to be in the middle of things, you know? So, you know, there's a lot of things like that. Let's talk about economic development. When I was growing up in Alabama, our, you know, economic development plan was, you know, all about cheap land and cheap gas and low cost positioning. And, you know, our, our, let's just, we decided, let's just, our, our rural economic development plan was, let's just widen all the highways. And then we line the highways with a bunch of junk. And I want to tell you something, that economic development plan doesn't work anymore. Today it's not about shotgun recruitment, it's about laser recruitment. It's not about low cost positioning, it's about high value positioning. You know, it's not about what you don't have, it's about what you do have. We call that asset-based economic development. You know, quality of life used to be completely unimportant. Now it is critically important to the success of any community in America. And this idea that, you know, you can grow one transaction at a time, you know, those communities are falling behind those communities who harness those transactions to a greater vision about the future of your community. And I can tell you that in the America we live in today, the most important infrastructure investment, it is not roads anymore, it is education education. Economic development like growth is about choices. You want to you know, try to recruit new business from somewhere else or you want to try to grow what you've already got here. And when you think about that question, think about the fact you're in competition with thousands of other communities. There are 157 incorporated communities just in Maryland. There are thousands of communities, and you know what we found out is that the one big thing rarely works in economic development. So first we had this arms race in America to build the biggest convention center. And you know, uh, a lot of cities really would never win that arms race. And then it was, you know, festival marketplaces, which worked fine in Boston and Baltimore. But did you know there were 19 other cities? that built festival marketplaces that went bankrupt within three years, like downtown Toledo or downtown Jacksonville or downtown Norfolk. You know, it was sort of the copycat logic of competition. Then it was like aquariums. Everybody had to have an aquarium. Even Camden, New Jersey, that's the aquarium in the bottom right corner up there, they thought if they could just spend an aquarium featuring the fish of New Jersey, that they could save Camden well, they spent $75 million building that aquarium. It's a very nice aquarium, but did it save Camden? No, it did not. Because successful economic development is rarely about the one big thing. Much more frequently, it's about lots of smaller things working synergistically together off of a plan that makes sense for you and your community. Let's talk about demographics. Demographics is destiny. You know, America's getting older, we're getting younger, we're getting more diverse. We have somebody turning age 65 eight, every eight seconds in America. That's going to happen every day, every eight seconds for the next 18 years. The biggest generation in American history is the millennial generation. And by the way, the fastest growing form of household in America is a single person living by themselves. That's the fastest growing form of household. That's 26% of all American households, single people living by themselves. And in most cities, it's even much higher than that. Go to New York, it's like 70%. Single people living by themselves. Most families don't have school-aged children anymore. They're people like me, empty nesters and retirees and unrelated singles living together, etc. But we build housing 
for 40 years, like every single family in America, was the Waltons. The mom, the dad, the two kids, and the dog. Well, that's a minority of American families today, ladies and gentlemen. Let's talk about young people. Young people are getting married later or not at all. They're driving less. They own fewer cars. You know, they are concentrating, as I said before, in major cities in a few cool, small towns. They favor walkable neighborhoods, not just in the cities, but in the suburbs and in the the suburbs that will be successful in the future are the ones that have some sort of walkable, mixed-use place, a town center, for example. Those are the places that are going to be successful in the future. Let's talk about technology, you know, the death of distance. You can run a business anywhere in the world today. So why would you pick Centerville or Queen Anne's County over any other place? Well, let me show you how quality of life might work. So some of you may have heard of Foster Freeze. He was uh, Rick Santorum's number one campaign contributor in the last presidential election. And in this election, he was a major contributor to a number of Republican candidates. And, you know, he's from a family that runs a, a group of mutual funds called the Brandywine Investment Group. And for about 40 years, this company that was founded by his father was headquartered in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. That's a busy suburb of Philadelphia. But this guy, he likes to fly fish. So every summer, he would fly out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming to go fly fishing. And then guess what? One day he's stuck in traffic on the Schuylkill Expressway and a, like a light bulb goes on in his mind. He says, hey, you know, I can run a mutual fund company anywhere in the world. So he picks up his entire company and he moves it into downtown Jackson, Wyoming. That's the largest private sector employer in Jackson today. Why is he there? Access to outdoor recreation. That's something you might have here as well. Interestingly, they did a study at Montana State University asking people why did they move to the three Montana counties that abutted Yellowstone National Park over a five-year period. Look at this is the list. They came up with number one, the main reason people moved, this was every new business relocation, whether from a doctor to a manufacturing name, it, was the beauty of the region. Now think about that. You know, 25 years ago, if you'd gone to the Bozeman County Commissioners and proposed they do something like pass a sign ordinance to protect the beauty of the region, they would have said something like, oh, that's bad for business. Turns out it's just the opposite. Preserving the beauty of the place is kind of important. And you know, when you think about the Eastern Shore, you got all the same exact things over here. Beautiful small towns, walkable and beautiful, farms and forests, open spaces in natural area. You know, the bay. But once again, no place will stay special by accident. You know, consumer attitudes are changing. This is a, a headline story from USA Today. And what this story is about is about the fact that the average amount of time that an American spends in a strip shopping center or a enclosed mall has been going down for years. People go to buy what they want and they leave. You know, young people aren't going to the mall to hang out anymore. They're going to restaurants. Did you know the average millennial goes out to dinner now 3.4 times a week? You know, think about that. You know, in fact, you know they go to the grocery store four times a week? They just buy what they want at Trader Joe's and go home. And they put that, you know, in the oven or whatever. So did you know we haven't built a new single new mall in the United States since 2006 and we've closed 15% of the rest of them and 30% of all the others are being turned inside out? And by the way, we have about a billion square feet of retail space empty out there on the highway outside of our towns. And, you know, just think about D.C., for example. In 1980, we had 10 regional malls in the D.C. area, 10. Well, you can't see them all there. The bottom ones are uh, Wheaton Mall and White Flint Mall. Did you know that seven of those 10 malls are gone now? Seven of the 10 on this list are gone, okay? Market trends, you know, the old one size fits all, you know, solution to housing simply doesn't work anymore when you got so many different kinds of people wanting so many different kinds of houses, which is why this idea of having a mix of housing types is so important. You know, I was just down in South Florida in Lee County, Fort, uh, Fort Myers, you know, and it was like the fastest growing place in the country, that in Las Vegas for many years, and it's like a lot of retirees there. 
And they all live in these, in the place, I went to this business, this community called Astero, Astero. It's a large gated golf course community with houses from three to 6,000 square feet. But guess what? Now all the people who live there are in their 70s. They all want to downsize. But they have zoned out every other form of housing. There are, they don't allow cottages. They don't allow small lot housing. They don't allow senior housing. They don't allow small detached housing. And by the way, the young people don't want to live in gated golf course communities. So they're having kind of a hard time selling those houses. If you're not thinking about the future, you won't be ready for the future. You know, different people want different kinds of things. And, and the truth is, almost everywhere in America today, we have an oversupply of large lot single family housing, what you see on the left, and an undersupply of virtually everything else. So we don't have enough small lot housing, in town housing, senior housing, cottages, and bungalows. I'm sorry that's cutting off half the page there, but uh, let's talk about four keys to the success of any community talent. Smart people, how do you attract and retain smart people? How do you keep the young people in Centerville? How do you keep the young people in Queen Anne County? Second, innovation, the ability to generate new ideas and turn those ideas into commercial realities. Connectivity, places where people and ideas can easily connect. And you know where that place is today? It's in our downtowns. And that's another big reason why so many companies are moving back into downtowns, even in small towns. You know, like the Viking Stove Company moved back into downtown Greenville, South Carolina, because they found that was the best place to attract and retain talented workers. And also you could go and talk to other people. But the most important thing I want to touch on tonight is this idea, place, distinctiveness of place. If you can't differentiate, if you can't differentiate Centerville, Maryland from any other community, you will have no competitive advantage. Differentiation. Successful communities are distinctive communities. Some of you have heard this slogan, keep Austin weird. You know, it's not just a funny slogan, it's actually they consider it an economic development imperative. It means keep them on the cutting edge, keep them different, keep them unusual, keep them unique. You know, the World Bank has a new publication out called The Economics of Uniqueness. They basically make two big points. One I've already made. They say if you can't differentiate your community, you'll have no competitive advantage. Same, then, they say, then they say, sameness is a minus, not a plus in the world we live in today. So yes, the unique characteristics of Centerville may be the only truly defensible source of competitive advantage that you have. So don't destroy all those characteristics. Build on them, enhance them, et cetera, et cetera. Just think about the definition of the word. What does distinctive mean? Cool, extraordinary, offbeat, original, special. Do you think that town would have a better chance of succeeding in the world economy today or a town that's common, ordinary, regular, standard, usual? Anybody want to tell me where this is? Anybody want to guess where this is? Well, I'll tell you where this is. This is Any Place USA. As the great American author Wallace Stegner once wrote, he said, quote, if you don't know where you are, you don't know who you are. And by that, of course, I think he meant that the, you know, that the f physical character of our communities is pretty darned important. And we all have a fundamental need for a sense of orientation, for a sense of roots, for a sense of place. When people talk about sense of place, what are they talking about? Well, two things, I think. One, it's what makes Centerville different from other communities. It's what makes Centerville different from Easton or what makes Centerville different from Dover, for example. But more importantly, I believe that sense of place, ladies and gentlemen, is explicitly that which makes our physical surroundings worth caring about. I can tell you that in many parts of the world today, we are suffering the social, economic, and environmental consequences of creating places that people just simply don't care about. So caring about a place is pretty important to your economic well-being. So how do you prevent Centerville from becoming any town USA? Well, it starts off by thinking about the fact that community character matters. As Mark Twain once wrote, he said, quote, we take stock of a city like we take stock of a man. The clothes or appearance are the externals by which we judge. Let's talk about a community's front door, its gateway. And just like with meeting a person, a good first impression is important and a bad first impression is hard to change, 
Do you think you'd rather visit the town of Franklin, Tennessee or Midfield, Alabama? Which one looks more like a community with a sense of pride and a sense of place? Which one looks more like a community that you would rather spend time or money in? If you don't remember anything else I say tonight, remember this. The image of this town is fundamentally important to its economic well-being. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that every single day in America, people make decisions about where to live, where to vacation, where to retire, where to invest based on what our communities look like. What they look like. Let's, you know, the home builders put it this way, say a community's appeal drives economic prosperity. Or how about tourism? Let's think about that for a second. So, uh, it's a little hard to see there. This is the official travel guide for the state of Oregon, and their slogan is, Oregon things look different here. Can you imagine a travel brochure that says something like, Maryland, things look the same here? <laughs> well, of course not, because who'd want to go there? The more Centerville, Maryland comes to look just like every place else in America, the less reason there would be to visit. On the other hand, the more a community does to enhance its uniqueness, whether that's architectural, natural, cultural, what have you, the more people want to visit because that's exactly what tourism is. If every place was just like every place else, there'd be simply no reason to go any place. So the image of your community is pretty important, and place matters in the world we live in today. In the traditional economy, it was all about markets. Today, it's all about places. The place is becoming more important than the product. What do the home builders mean when they say that? What they mean is what is going on outside of the house is more important than what's going on inside of the house. So, you know, the, uh, you've seen signs like this from time to time. You know, we, did a, we were talking to some real estate appraisers, and we asked them about this, and they said, and I quote, you can put a dollar value on a view Scenic landscapes like you have here on the Eastern Shore are an economic asset, not just because you and I think they're nice, but because other people are willing to pay to see the view and to experience the unique character of a place. They go on to say, quote, housing, hotels, and offices with scenic views always command premium prices. The better the view, the higher the price. So, okay, let's think about this. How, you know, you go to the beach in the summer, you rent a hotel room with a view of the ocean, you will pay more for that room than the exact same room on the other side of the hotel. What are you paying for? You're paying for the view. I want to suggest to you the scenic landscapes of Queen Anne County have quantifiable economic value, which is just one of the reasons why some of these landscapes are worth preserving. And yes, there are literally hundreds of studies that show that green space increases the value of adjacent property. You know, you know, you all probably could figure this out. Where's the most valuable land in all of New York? It's the land next to Central Park. So let's talk about this issue for a second. How do you arrange development? So we've talked about where you might put it, what's it look like, how do you arrange it? There's a lot of different ways you could arrange development. We had a model for development in America for about 250 years and we called it a town. And towns always had a few things in common. They always had an edge and a center. You knew where the town ended and the countryside began. And the towns were also always walkable and pedestrian friendly. The towns always had a mix of uses and housing types. You had big houses and you had small houses and you had churches and you had schools and you had stores. And you know, they were architecturally coherent and beautiful like your town. And you had a pretty wonderful sense of place and community. But then we forgot about all that. About 1960, we came up with this new model for development. We call it sprawl. And now there is no edge and there is no center. You don't know when the town ends and where the countryside is because it just keeps on going for mile after mile. You know, down in Atlanta now, sprawl goes 100 miles across. 100 miles across. You know, and of course, you've got to get in your car then to drive everywhere for every single thing. And of course, we segregate all the houses and uses today. So we put the $400,000 houses in that subdivision and the $300,000 houses over there, the regional high school over there, the shopping center over there, which of course guarantees we've got to drive everywhere. It's architecturally chaotic and ugly. And it's very hard to have a sense of community. And there is no sense of place. 
And then we do things like this. We used to have, you know, a grid of streets like you have in old Centerville. And, and you, you know, it's interesting when you talk about people walking, you know, they say about walkable communities. Do you know, you notice that we've learned that if you just live in a community that has nothing but like cul-de-sacs, people don't really like to just walk from one end of the cul-de-sac to the other and back. You know, just like, people like to walk around a block. Walk around a block. And by the way, did you know that the corners are always the most valuable land in real estate? So when you have more corners, you have more valuable real estate. Let me give you an example of that. So the Mormon church, which owns most of the land in Salt Lake City, they have the longest blocks in America, quarter mile blocks. They're cutting all the blocks in half because they realized that they were, they were hurting themselves from an economic standpoint as well, from a walkability standpoint. And I talked about this issue of, you know, this is kind of what we've been doing over here for years, is you know, just plopping houses out in cornfields. But I want to ask you to think about this. Do you think the size of the lot is more important? Or do you think the character of the neighborhood is more important? And I tell you, we've polled people on this, and people will say, oh, yeah, the neighborhood, you know, give me a nice neighborhood. And if you think the lot size is so important, why do you think we have 15,000 golf course developments in America? And the reason, of course, is because golf developers figured out they could charge a lot premium for anywhere from like 10 to like 30% more for a house next to a golf course than the exact same house not next to a golf course. But guess what? Did you know that the vast majority of buyers at golf course in America do not play golf? So you say, well, why did you buy the house there? And I'll tell you what they'll tell you. They'll say, oh, I like the view across the fairway. I like to live next to protected open space. Well, like, duh. What's it cost to build a golf course? Millions of dollars. What's it cost to maintain a golf course? Millions of dollars. What's it cost to leave the open space alone in the first place? Like almost nothing. So a growing number of developers have started to realize that they could build a golf course development without the golf course. It's what we call a conservation development. You know, and no, you can't play golf there, but you can walk your dog, you can throw a frisbee, you can have a picnic, you can do anything that you want. And by the way, did you know that uh, one of the fastest and most popular trends in America today is actually putting agriculture back into developments? They're calling them agro-hoods. I used to call them conservation developments, and people like them because they preserve open space, they reduce infrastructure costs. You know, we talk about 15% impervious surface. So, but let's think about this. So you had 100 acres, and suppose the zoning was one house per acre, and so there's no wetlands or anything like that. So what would make more sense, to have 100 one-acre house lots or 100 half-acre house lots and 50 acres of open space? And by the way, turns out people will pay more to live next to open space. And by the way, when you only develop on half the land, the road lengths are half as long. So you reduce the infrastructure costs while helping to preserve rural character. So just these, just a few examples of some of these. They're all over the country. I'll show you two that I've been to recently. Serenby outside of Atlanta. So 220 acre, uh, 220 home development has a 25 acre organic farm, three restaurants, a country inn, a system of interconnecting trails and pathways and abundant green space. Here's one out in Loudoun County. This is the fastest growing suburban development in the Washington metropolitan area. It won the National Association of Home Builders Community the Year Award. It has set aside over 60% of their open space in permanent preservation. They have a 300 acre working farm they grow in the development 50 varieties of fruits and vegetables. They have chickens and hens. They have goats for mowing the grass. They have bees for honey and pollination. They have a weekly CSA program, a market stand, and they work with all the schools. Uh, this is a quote from one of the largest master plan development community developers in America, Bert, Brent Harrington, who works for DMB. He says, it has been, as a developer, it's been humbling to see how such a thing as a simple and small thing as a farm can be a development's most loved amenity. This is a company that spent $75 million for a golf course and a spa in a community in Arizona. And then they also developed a 10 acre farm that grows tropical fruits and vegetables. They bought the land, paid the farmer for $800,000. It's had a far bigger impact on their sales and marketing than their $75 million golf course. 
So all right, so let's talk about what the other choice might be. You could build a lot more tracked housing over here. You know, where all the houses are tan, beige, putty, and taupe. And you know, they always, you know, they only have, you know, they, they, they sort of like old time TVs. They only have like the design on the front of the house. So they like put brick here and then they have vinyl on the sides and on the back. You know, that's, we don't call, we, and then they put a three car garage out in front like that says cars live here. So let me tell you a story about that. So I live in Tacoma Park. And Tacoma Park is a, the oldest suburb of Washington. It was set up, settled in 1883. And we have a historic district there, which we set up after the Metro came out there. And we had all these developers start buying up every vacant lot in town. We have all these old Victorian houses, and they wanted to put like split level houses in the middle of it. We said, no, no, I don't think so. Why don't you give us some nice neo-Victorian houses? And so I had this developer come in one day, and he has this giant two-car garage sticking out in front of the house. And I said, no, no, you can't do that. You got, because I was the chairman of the Preservation Commission. I said, you got to detach the garage. And he starts screaming at me and the rest of the preservation commission saying, no one will buy a house without an attached garage. That's what he says to us, okay? Well, did you know that there was not a single house in the city of Tacoma Park that had an attached garage? Because every house was built there from 1883 to 1942 and there was no such thing. So I say to him, well, who's buying all the rest of the houses in this town? Not in, none of them have attached garages. No one will buy a house without an attached garage. So we, he said, I'm going to sue you if you don't let me put this garage out front. And I said, okay, you sue us. Then he thought better of it. He came back with a detached garage, put it in the back of the house, and the house sold in two days. It was sort of like behavior modification. <laughs> and that's what I mean by having, you know, houses that fit in. So let me hear, you know, you got a couple of examples over here. These is, I took some pictures over at Gibson's Grant not too long ago. And I just want to show you what's different about Gibson's Grant from your typical subdivision. Well, first of all, they have traditional architectural styles. They have four-sided architecture. They put the garages in the back of the house. They don't think about green space as the leftover land. They actually design around like small parks and green spaces, which is what you could do at Chesterfield as well. Just, you know, have, leave the waterfront alone. And by the way, when you could get to the water, everybody get the water, you, the property becomes a lot more valuable. As opposed to if somebody just, their house backed onto the water, then nobody else could, you know, that person would have a very valuable house, but nobody else could use it or see it or get the value from it. So walkable places, ladies and gentlemen, create real estate value. And there's many, many examples of this. And there's a, really a big growing demand, I believe, for sort of small town village living. Do you know what the fastest growing town in Maryland is today? Frederick. Frederick, Maryland today has... This is a city that had a terrible flood in 1990. Now there are 5,000 people living in downtown Frederick. There are 300 retailers and restaurants. There are 25 small high-tech companies right in downtown Frederick because it's a town that actually decided to preserve what made it unique. And, you know, they did put in this little thing called the Carroll Creek Walk, which is like a small-town version of the San Antonio River Walk. By the way, they've just extended it about a mile. Uh, you wouldn't believe what it's uh, like there today. Compact can be attractive and extraordinarily valuable. This is the community of Celebration in Florida. It was built by the Disney Corporation. And you know, as I said, the market is changing. And when the market changes, the world tells you something. So, you know, when, when walkable communities are commanding values, hundreds of percent more than drive everywhere for every kind of thing community, you start to pay attention. And that's what's happening all over America. So, you know, let's talk about Kentlands, Maryland. It, it, the real estate prices in Kentlands are 100% higher than they are in Sterling, Virginia. They're both the same distance out from the city. Kentlands is a walkable, mixed-use suburb. Sterling is a drive-everywhere-for-everything suburb. One convert And let's think about, you know, what are the most valuable neighborhoods for square foot in all of Washington, like Alexandria, Georgetown, you know, why would everybody in Alexandria, every house in Alexandria costs at least like a million and a half dollars. And why do people want to pay a million and a half dollars for a house that's 200 years old? Is that because they like to do home repair? <laughs> no. Because people will pay a lot of money for charm and walkability. And we just haven't been building many of those kind of communities anymore. 
So when you actually build a community that is walkable and pedestrian friendly, you all of a sudden have set yourself apart. You have differentiated yourself. And you know, let's talk about density. You know, so here's five acres units per acre on the left, and there's ten, almost nine units per acre on the right. That's the battery in Charleston. Where would you rather live? You know, it's not about density, it's about the design. You know, do you know what the density in Old Town Alexandria is? It's 18 units an acre, and Georgetown is 22 units an acre. They're some of the most walkable and beautiful places on the planet Earth. You can create new communities that have that same kind of charm even without that kind of density. And you've got a few on the, over here. So Ron Cassio's project in Berlin, which he built around a little town square. Or how about Ship Carpenter Square in Lewis? Anybody ever been to Lewis? This is the most valuable non-waterfront real estate in the entire state of Delaware. Because they built it around green space and they moved a bunch of old, it's all old houses, they moved there from somewhere else. These are not new houses at all. Or how about Easton Village or Cook's Hope, where they have the designer cows. Have you seen the designer cows down at yeah. Cook's Hope? And what's the most popular thing for people in new house developments today? Walking trails and bike paths, number one, and lots of natural open space, number two. Golf courses way down the bottom of the list. And this is what Richard Florida says about the kind of communities we've been building. He says, low density sprawl is ill-suited to a creative post-industrial economy. So I just want to sum up some of the benefits of walkable communities. They promote health. If you actually have a community with like blocks that you can walk in, people actually walk, not because you're forced to, because people just do. And also, they, you know, you can maybe get rid of a car or one car. They have, we have this thing over in D.C. we call car light living. My son is an example. They got married, he and his wife both had cars. Now they only have one car. And by the way, you know how much you spend on a car per year? for insurance and gas and car payments, about $11,000 a year on average. That's a lot of money you could put into a house payment, for example, or vacations or anything else that you might want. And as it turns out now, I talked about, you know, the more walkable a community is, the more valuable it is. Nationwide, we found that every increase in walk score by one point means a $700 to a $3,000 increase in housing value. And now we're finding the same thing with commercial areas walkable commercial areas are outperforming strip shopping centers. So let's talk for a second about commercial development. This is the old paradigm, strip mall coming soon. Ladies and gentlemen, strip development is development for the last century. The future belongs to town centers and main streets and downtowns. And I want to tell you there's a few reasons for that. And you know, this is a kind of a brief summary, but let me just go over a few of these. Did you know that we kind of completely overbuilt out there on the highway because that was the only place we put any retail space for like 30 years. But did you also know that we were building retail space five times faster than retail sales for the 25 years before the recession? Which is one of the reasons why we have a billion square feet of empty strip development in the United States and mostly empty big box stores. And, you know, think about this. So, you know, in 1980, if you had, uh, or 1960, if you had 200,000 square feet of retail space, it was in a four-story building on a downtown street. It had a footprint of about one acre, and we called it a department store. And then by 1980, if you had 200,000 square feet of retail space, it was in a one-story building. It had a footprint of about four acres surrounded by 12 to 20 acres of parking. We called that a Walmart. We, you know, it's not just we changed the same amount of square foot of retail. Think about the footprint, though, of the development. And, of course, this meant now we had to get in the car to go everywhere for everything, as I already talked about. Now, what else is happening? What about the e-commerce? Anybody ever here shopped on Amazon? Did you know that all the big box stores in America are shrinking? They're all getting smaller because they don't need all that space anymore and they're in competition with like people like Amazon. And also the suburbs are being redesigned because they realize that this kind of development that I was talking about is just not competitive in the world that we live in anymore. So, you know, here's a, an article from New York Times, our love affair with malls is on the rocks. I talked about those 10 obsolete malls in DC. So here's an example. So in 1972 in Rockville's infinite wisdom, 
they had decided to tear down their entire downtown. And they replaced it with the Rockville Mall. But guess what? Now they've torn the mall down and put the downtown back. <laughs> and that's kind of a metaphor for America. And the successful communities in the future are being communities that are thinking about this kind of stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the new promised land. You can turn a NIMBY into a YIMBY. You remember, you know, remember that Joni Mitchell song about you tear up paradise and put in the parking lot? Well, now we can start tearing up the parking lots and putting our communities back together again. And you know, there's a lot of reasons because we got all this space out in front of these buildings and they've got infrastructure there and they've got highways in front and it's a way to save rural land and so on and so forth. And so here's kind of the, you know, what we're doing. We're going from spread out single use drive only that's a best buy let me show you another new best buy okay that's in a compact mixed use walkable building and i understand all of you don't want to sleep upstairs and shop downstairs but there are a lot of people who actually do like that idea and you know let me show you a closer to home example in the economics of this so this is the barnes and noble on the left is on rockville pike in montgomery county that is the busiest road in the state of maryland by the way and that is the Rockville, I mean, that is the Barnes and Noble on the right in downtown Bethesda. It's part of what's something called Bethesda Row. The one on the left has all kinds of parking in front, and the one on the right has none. The one on the left is one story, the one on the right is three stories. Which one makes more money? Well, the Barnes and Noble on the right makes 20% more per square foot than the one on the left. How is that possible, even though the one on the left is on the busiest road in Maryland? Well, let's think about that. How can you get to the Rockville Pikes of the world? There's only one way to get there. It's called drive your car. How can you get to downtown Bethesda? Well, as it turns out, there's four ways to get there. You can drive your car, and there's a five-story parking garage behind the Barnes & Noble, surrounded by stores on all sides. You can take the metro there, because there's a metro stop a block away. You can ride your bike there, because the Capitol Crescent bike trail is across the street. You can walk there because thousands of people live within a 10 minute walk of the down Barnes and Noble. And by the way, the Barnes and Noble downtown Bethesda has a big advantage over Rockville Pike. You know, people actually will hang out in downtown Bethesda. Nobody wants to hang out on Rockville Pike because the place is so congested and so ugly. So people go to buy what they want and they leave. When you start building places that people want to hang out, you'll start creating value in your communities. And here's a small town example. Here's a brand new Dairy Queen in the town of Herndon, Virginia. It has a dentist's office upstairs. How appropriate. <laughs> and by the way, who'd you rather live next door to anyway? A house full of out of control teenagers or a dentist's office? Which one would have a greater impact on your quiet enjoyment of your home? It's not about the use, it's about the impact of the use. Let me show you another example. So I was down in uh, Arkansas a couple weeks ago and I'm driving down the interstate from the airport, which is up near Bentonville. And I saw this Waffle House. It's on the, the one on the left there. And I really didn't pay any attention to that Waffle House, because you've all seen Waffle Houses out by interstate highway exits, you know, everywhere. Until I, then I drove into downtown Fayetteville, and there was another Waffle House. And there it is, right on the right. And it has three stories of housing right above, upstairs. There is no parking in front of this except on-street parking. And I thought, that's really interesting. I have never seen a Waffle House with housing upstairs in a brand new building. So I go over and I run around and I find the, the Fayetteville City Hall and I walk in and say, could you tell me about that, about that Waffle House? And they say, sure. They've already done a study on this and it turns out that the downtown Waffle House is outperforming the strip Waffle House by 15%. But more importantly, ladies and gentlemen, it's producing more taxes per acre, more jobs per acre, more residents per acre. There are 42 people live upstairs. No one lives upstairs above the Waffle House out on the highway. And by the way, what you can't see at the bottom is if, you know, if you eat a lot of waffles, you probably need a walk after you go there. <laughs> so it's actually part of a walkable community. And, you know, there's this thing we, in the real estate world, we call it the place-making dividend. People stay longer, come back more often, and spend more money in places that attract their affection. So what about those Walmarts that I was talking about? Well, that's changing, too. And how many people have seen some of the new Walmarts in D.C.? I'll show you our first one. Here it is. That is a brand new building. That's a block from Union Station. It has 200 apartments above the Walmart. It actually, the Walmart actually has real windows that let in real sunlight. That's a first in America. 
Where's the parking? The parking's underneath the Walmart. There's a swimming pool on the roof. There's a fitness center in the glassed-in area above the front door there. And why is Walmart willing to do this? Because there's only one place left in America with more spending power than stores. That's in our cities and towns. And so they're doing this all over the place. That's the second Walmart in, Amer in Washington right there on the top. That's at the Fort Totten Metro Station. You would have thought they'd never done this, but this is happening all over. There's a Target in Minneapolis. There's a Target in Stamford. Here's a Home Depot in New York. And I showed this to a group of people recently. Somebody said, well, how do you get your lumber home? And the answer is they deliver. Well, there's a concept. <laughs> they deliver. But you say, well, they couldn't do this in a small town. Well, yes, they can. Here's a brand new small town Walmart in downtown Bentonville, Arkansas, where the Walmart company, the icon of American suburbia, is spending hundreds of millions of dollars to turn this community into a walkable, pedestrian-friendly place because they couldn't get people to move there and want to work for them. They are transforming this community. You've heard of the Crystal Bridges Museum or the 21C Museum Hotel or, you know, things like this. This is the future in America, ladies and gentlemen. So I want to end by just sharing with you what I call my secrets of successful communities. I've been in this business for 40 years. I've come to some conclusions about why some communities are successful and many others are not. First and foremost, successful communities always have a vision for the future. Some people might call that a plan for the future. And I understand there's some people who think planning is a bad word. But I always ask those people, then you tell me the name of any successful organization, institution, corporation, or community that doesn't plan for the future. Failing to plan simply means planning to fail. As the book of Proverbs says, without vision, the people will perish. And those visions always begin by inventorying your assets and people build all their plans, whether it's a land use plan, an economic development plan, a tourism plan or whatever, around the enhancement of their existing assets. Successful communities use education, incentives, partnerships, and voluntary initiatives, not just regulation. Now, I didn't say I'm against regulation, it prevents bad things from happening, it sets a minimum standard of conduct. But you gotta use carrots, not just sticks. You need to make it easier to do the right thing and harder to make it do the wrong thing. We've been doing the opposite for so many years. You need to pick and choose among development proposals. You know what the biggest impediment to better development on the Eastern Shore is? I'll tell you what it is. It's a fear of saying no to anything. Well, if you're afraid to say no to anything, you will get the worst of everything. Communities that set no standards or low standards will simply compete right to the bottom. Communities that set high standards will compete to the top because they know, they've learned, that if you say no to bad development, you'll always get better development in its place. Successful communities cooperate with their neighbors for mutual benefits. Successful communities consider what they look like. Successful communities have strong leaders and committed citizens. Let me show you a couple of examples of this. This is Chattanooga, Tennessee. This is the one city that somebody growing up in Birmingham used to make fun of. Now, what does that tell you? It was called the most polluted city in America, but nobody makes fun of Chattanooga anymore. It's now known as an international model for community revitalization. It all began with a vision for the future. They got thousands of people involved in thinking about the future of Chattanooga. They said, what do you like? What don't you like? What do you want to change? What do you want to keep? And, you know, they decided to focus on two things, downtown, because that's the heart and soul of any community, and the Tennessee River, because that was their most important natural asset. When they started, all of downtown Chattanooga used to look like that, one boarded up empty building after another. And then they restored that one building. And somebody said, hey, that looks great, how'd you do that? Then they restored two buildings, then they restored four buildings, then they did six buildings, then pretty soon they were doing really big projects like this. This is the outlet mall, it's not on the highway. It's in restored warehouse buildings right in downtown Chattanooga. This is the Tennessee River Gorge. It's 15 minutes from downtown Chattanooga, led to the foundation of the first land trust in the South, the Tennessee River Gorge Trust. All that land today is preserved. They saved their view and they got a tax break too. And then they decided to put a river walk along the Tennessee River for 10 miles, both sides. And when they originally talked about it back in 1973, the original price tag was $15 million, which was a lot of money for a small city. But I want to tell you something. How much something costs is not the most important question. It is the second most important question. 
What is the most important question facing any community? It's what should we do? What should we do? And as that turns out, money will almost always follow good ideas if those ideas come out of a consensus building process. And so they built that river walk and it's leveraged over a billion dollars in adjacent investment. And because they had a vision for the future, they were able to do some pretty remarkable things. Like this is the Walnut Street Bridge in downtown Chattanooga, obsolete highway bridge, Tennessee DOT was gonna tear it down. They had set aside millions of dollars for the demolition of this bridge. But Chattanooga said, no, we got a better idea. Give us that money, we'll turn it into the nation's longest pedestrian bridge. It now connects on one side of the river to the other. Susan City, California, a small town in Northern California, 1980 was voted the worst place to live in Northern California. That was, by the way, their city hall, two double wide trailers. This was the only city hall in California you had to register with the Department of Motor Vehicles. <laughs> but you know, public buildings are kind of important. And they were always our most beautiful buildings before World War II, whether it was our library, our courthouse, you know, public schools, you name it. And they were almost always in the middle of our towns. And then you know what we decided? We decided cheaper was better. And you know what we've learned? We've learned that cheaper is simply cheaper. And you know what they said to themselves in Susan City, California? They said, why would anybody invest in a community that wouldn't invest in itself? And so guess what? They built a new city hall right on that same spot. And a decade later, they were voted one of the best places to live in Northern California, but it all began with an investment in themselves. Now let's talk about how a small housing development might transform a small town. Welcome to Port Royal, South Carolina. This was a funky little town going no place, right outside the Paris Island Marine Corps base. So there was, if, there was a guy who found a piece of land, kind of like the Carter Farm, right on the edge of town. And they decided they weren't going to put a bunch of cul-de-sacs in there. They were going to extend the street grid in there and put some parks in there and have narrow streets. And then he went to an architect and said, could you design some new houses for me that look like old South Carolina houses? He said, sure, we could do that. And they built 41 new houses and they all sold in less than six months. And those 41 houses changed this town forever for the better. And now you have 41 new families living in new houses that look like old houses and everything starts to change in the town. So this was their city hall. Check this out, this was their city hall. But now you have a new sort of lease on life. And so they decide, well, maybe we could invest in a new city hall right on that same spot. And then they have their, this was their downtown and it was one boarded up empty building after another. But now you got 41 new families living in town. All of a sudden they start looking at those buildings with a fresh set of eyes and they start restoring them one after another. And then they had this little elementary school and uh, the school board said, the school's too small. We've got to tear the school down. We're going to move out to the highway. But now they have these new families, and they say, no, 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 don't do that. Why don't you put an addition on the school, and then all the kids could still walk? And they go, oh, never thought of that. So they put an addition on the school, and now all the kids can walk to school. And then the uh, post office said, well, we're too small now, too. We're going to move out to the highway. And they said, no, you're not, because our vision is to have the healthy downtown. The, down the post office needs to be in the heart of downtown. We'll find you a new piece of land, and when you do that, you're going to build us this beautiful neoclassical post office. It all began with a vision for the future. Inventory your assets. What is it that makes Centerville special, different, unique? Sometimes the assets of the community are very obvious. Welcome to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, world-class scenery, unparalleled wildlife resources. Welcome to Annapolis, you know, incredible historic architecture. Sometimes the assets of the community are not very obvious. Welcome to Lowell, Massachusetts. 1975, it was a dying industrial city, it had an unemployment rate of 27%. It had never seen a single tourist and it thought it had no assets. But what it had was abandoned textile mills had good leadership and a vision to restore all of those mills into something better. Today, it's the Charleston, South Carolina of New England. Today, they get a million tourists a year. You know, how about the torpedo factory in Alexandria? Who would have thought they could turn that into the most successful art center in the United States with almost 200 working artists that gets millions of visitors a year? Or how about Columbus, Georgia? Their most important asset was the Chattahoochee River. They had a terrible flood, but they realized that adversity can breed opportunity, and so they built one of the best river walks in America, and that brought their downtown back to life again. 
Or how about Paducah, Kentucky, that decided to turn all of their flood walls into art galleries? Or how about Akron, Ohio, which used to be the world headquarters for the Quaker Oats Company, but they didn't tear down their old grain elevators, they turned it into the Hilton Hotel that was the beginning of the Quaker Oats redevelopment plan for the city. Or how about in Cincinnati that had a, turned a park into a parking lot and they said, no, that's probably not the best thing for our city. Let's put the park right back where it started. Or how about Rapid City, South Dakota? That, you know, they used to fight about, was there enough parking downtown? You know, parking's important, but you know, if you have a parking problem, do you know what that means? You're successful. You know, it's actually, you, you, you need to have some place that people want to go to to park. So they actually created, took that parking lot out and put in a town square and put a water feature in it, and all of a sudden people started coming back into the town again. How about Poughkeepsie, New York? Some of you have probably heard of the High Line in New York City, but this is the small town version of that. That's the high bridge over the Hudson River, 220 feet above the river. That bridge was abandoned in 1993, and it sat there for years. And now they've turned it into a state park. The walk across the Hudson State Park, 1.1 mile long, 220 feet above the river. Now they're getting almost a million visitors a year going to a small city that no one was visiting before. Successful communities use education, incentives, partnerships, and voluntary initiatives. Why do we educate? In order to reduce the need to regulate. Why do we educate? Because people won't embrace what they don't understand. Why do we educate? Because you have a right to choose your future, but also to know what the choices are. We should use carrots, not just sticks. And there are a lot of things that, you know, are examples of incentives besides free Cokes. So conservation easements, that's one. That's a voluntary, you know, program. Or how about this? This is the Lone Star Brewery in San Antonio that sat vacant until they used an historic preservation tax credit to turn it into a world-class museum of art. Or how about Yazoo City, Mississippi, where all they did was pass out free paint to downtown business owners, and they painted their way back to life again. So, you know, you know, successful communities cooperate with their neighbors for mutual benefit. You know, think about the research triangle. You know, Raleigh-Durham had an economy based on three dying industries, furniture, tobacco, and textiles. But they had three great universities and they decided to build a research park that would harness the power of those three great universities. Now it's the largest tech park in the United States. Or how about the Blues Highway in Mississippi? Connects Memphis to New Orleans. I can tell you that nobody's gonna plan to go on vacation to Greenville, Mississippi just because they wanna to go to Greenville, but they will drive through Greenville as part of the Blues Highway, because they co cooperate with all their neighbors. Successful communities pick and choose. All development is not created equal. Welcome to Westerville, Ohio, where CVS came in and proposed their standard off-the-shelf CVS. They said, no, we want a CVS that looks like it fits in with our small town, and they stuck to their guns and they got it. You say no to bad development, you're gonna get better development in its place. Charleston County, South Carolina stopped saying yes to subdivisions like this and st instead they started getting neighborhoods like this because they had a higher expectations. You know, this it'll do attitude towards new development simply won't work in a community where capital is foot loose. It's the communities that set themselves apart once again that will be successful. Successful communities have hometown heroes. That's a small group of people willing to set themselves apart. And I understand it's not always easy getting things done in small towns, and you probably have heard this here in Centerville. You know, no matter what somebody will propose, somebody else will tell you, can't do it, won't work, cost too much, tried it already. And you know, no is a powerful word in America, but I want to tell you a more powerful word, yes. Yes, we can make Centerville a better place to live in, to look at, to work in, to visit. And you know, Leadership is kind of important, but it's often unappreciated. I love this quote from Monty Python. You can't, can't read the whole thing, but it, it's from the movie Monty uh, uh, The Life of Brian. It says, apart from sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, roads, irrigation, public health, and a freshwater system, what have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> you don't care who gets the credit, you can get an awful lot done. All right, I want to end by asking you to think briefly about the social and psychological value of what I've talked about tonight. Why is it, do you think, 
that people feel a sense of loss, like losing a loved one or a friend. When a grove of trees is cut down, an historic building demolished, a scenic farm obliterated like the Carter Farm. It's not because we can't build new buildings or plant new trees. I, it's because I believe, ladies and gentlemen, our sense of identity as of individuals, as Americans, as citizens of the Eastern Shore is tied in a very profound way to special buildings and places and views. These are the places that are invested with rich symbolic importance that contribute to our sense of identity and well-being in a way no less fundamental than religion or language or culture. In fact, in ancient Rome, there was a maxim that said, quote, cities should preserve the visible symbols of their identity to give citizens a sense of security in a changing world. What we're oftentimes really trying to preserve, I believe, is memory. It's an attempt to keep a mental grip on the familiar and accustomed places that make us feel comfortable and secure. Ladies and gentlemen, you can grow without destroying the things that people love. I want to end by just showing you a little, telling you a little story. So I was in the Army, I said, for a couple of years, and I had a friend, his name was Jeff Miller. He's from Bayfield, Wisconsin. That's the northernmost town of Wisconsin. I went to visit him after I got out of the Army. And we were walking around in this uh, farm right outside of town, and we see this rock. And I walk up to that rock, and it says this. It said, this site was proposed for development in 1983 through joint efforts. This development was proven. And I was looking at this like, what in the world is this all about? And then, of course, we walked around to the back of the rock, and it said this. This marker is dedicated to the ancestors of the Ojibwe nation who lie beneath this ground. Ladies and gentlemen, a vision counts, but implementation is priceless. Thank you so much for having me here this afternoon. I would say probably you would not want to put big commercial in there, but you might be able to put like a country inn in there, for example, or, or some small scale kind of things. You might have a, could have a farm stand in there, maybe a, you know, something small, but the fact that it was within a, you know, a short walk of downtown, if you do that right, that can bring this whole downtown back to life as well. And that's, that's the idea. And, and, if you, and if you have some diversity in housing type, you can get, you know, and by the way, this is so interesting because I'm one of these, uh, you know, AARP, I, I spend a lot of time looking at their research, and they always keep saying that the vast majority of seniors want to age in place. And, you know, what's interesting about that is most seniors will also tell you they don't want to live with a bunch of, just a bunch of other old people. And so the, 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 we're start, we have, a, we have a, a, a division, we have a group called the Product Council at ULI, it's called the Senior Housing uh, Council, and they will tell you that the senior housing developments of the future are going to be multi-generational because the old people want to, don't want to live around just like other old people. And let me give you an example. So I live in, I said, Tacoma Park, and I'm, I've got some uh, orthopedic issues, some pretty, pretty serious ones. And so we have a program called Lifelong Tacoma. And the idea is all voluntary. No, you don't have to pay a thing for this. If you're over uh, 65, like I am, you can sign up for it. And so we had the big, you know, we had the big snowstorm last year uh, and uh, earlier this year, and uh, literally within, I signed up for this thing, uh, within 20 minutes of the end of the snowstorm, I had five people in my driveway shoveling it out, okay? And these are not people we're paying, these are younger people from families who live in Tacoma Park. But you know what the older people do, like my wife? Well, we run a, we have a system of walking school buses in Tacoma Park, and, the, and seniors <laughs> walk to school on a, on a, a route pick up young kids and walk them home every day. The idea, and, and by the way, they'll also help with things like for seniors for picking up prescriptions or taking you to doctor's appointments if you can't drive. This is how you keep a community where people could age in place. And if you actually built some, some communities out here where you, know, you could walk into the downtown, that's even better because seniors also tell us they like to live close to services and amenities and you know and to doctors and things like that but when if you're too old to drive too young to drive too sick to drive too poor to drive you're just out of luck in, in America and so that's another reason why walkable communities are so important and I loved growing up in a community where my kids walk to school every day and you know you could probably do that here as well so anyway so try to build on the, the things you got yes sir well I try to spend you know the ULI is uh, made up of builders, developers, financiers, elected officials, and so I spend a lot of my time talking to developers, and a lot of the material that I'm presenting tonight is being 
you know, that's what I've gotten from developers. Now, you know, the kind of people, you know, the, the problem is that they, there's, there's developers and there are builders, the sort of home builders. And, you know, a lot of those, a lot of people in the home building I have this idea, they're very risk averse. They have this idea that if I built a house and it looks like this, I sold it yesterday, then that's their, that's their idea of marketing. I, I built that yesterday and I sold it, so I'll build the same thing again tomorrow. Now, let, let's talk about that for a second. So the kind of way ULI would look at this is they would say, a, a ULI developer would say to me, like the people who did the Rockville Town Center, that developers need to study demographics the way a stockbroker studies the market because success in the future is about getting in front of the inevitable. So let me give you an example of this. So West Palm Beach, Florida uh, has an incredible new neo-traditional infill development called City Place. And it has about 600 units of housing in this development. And when it was first proposed, a traditional market analysis would have told you that there was no market for housing in downtown West Palm Beach, Florida, because there was no housing in downtown West Palm Beach, Florida. So that's a backwards looking analysis. There is no housing, so there is no market for housing. A forward looking analysis, which is, well, this is a place a lot of people would like to retire or work or you know, single people might live there, would tell you that there is a pent up demand for housing that has not been met. That looks at the demographics, the psychographics, et cetera. They built that place and, and it filled up like a, almost overnight. That's the kind of thinking that needs to, we need more of. And I, I tell you, here's what I've learned about development stuff. Uh, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, but what you know is worth a thousand pictures is a real project. Kick the, kick the tires on a real project. So I, you know, one of the things I was suggesting to Rob Itkin tonight was that, you know, the planning commission from Centerville and from Queen Anne County ought to get in a car some weekend or a little van and drive down to Buford County, South Carolina and go look at the new housing developments being built in that part of the world like Habersham or New Point or the village at Port Royal and it will blow you away. People will, and you can kick the tire. Go talk to all the builders. Go talk to all the homeowners. Ask them what they think about it. And it'll, it'll, you know, they'll come back transformed because the problem is we have so few examples around here of good new development. You know, everything is, you know, and like everything is either like a high rise expensive condo or like a single family house. And we have nothing in between. And, you know, so when you go and actually see a place like this, people start to go, wow, I didn't realize you could do stuff like that. And stuff like that, and the, the, those are, there's a few places, you know, I, I think Easton Village is pretty well done. I think Gibson's Grant's pretty well done. Uh, Cook's Hope is pretty well done. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. You drive through like 50 acres of, you know, fields with designer cows, and then you come to a village. Well, there's a concept. Um, so, you know, but by and large, we don't have a lot of these projects. You go to Kentlands and, but you know, the problem over here is if, if you send people to Montgomery County, they go, oh, well, that's Montgomery County. So you, nobody would pay attention to that. But if you went down to, there's a whole bunch of projects in coastal South and North Carolina that would just blow your minds. And uh, so one of the things that I try to do is get builders to go see these projects and look at them. Yes, ma'am. Well, yeah, well, so, okay. So let's talk about that. So Easton Village, I tell you what, when Elm Street Development first proposed that, it was proposed for, for a mixed use project and they were gonna have some commercial in there and everybody opposed it. So they didn't build any commercial in there. And that, that's what happens. I mean, Gibson Grant's is the same thing. So just think if you were living in Gibson Grant and there was a little country store in there where you could get coffee, buy bread, get a newspaper, wouldn't that be an asset to that development? And, and so, so that's how you need to think about what you're doing out here. This is the last big property you have right on the edge of town. And if you do it right, you can, tr you can really give this town a real kick for the, in the positive direction. If you do it wrong, you'll just have another suburban subdivision. I mean, you'll just, you know, okay, well, you want to have, you don't like Montgomery County? Well, we just keep building Montgomery County over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, we've done a lot. I mean, one of the things that I would say, and this is a problem, you know, the, the biggest problem in hot market cities, and D.C. is one of those, is affordability, okay? D.C. is becoming unaffordable for lots of people because it's so desirable and expensive now. 
So, and, and oftentimes the only response to this is we need high rise density. You know, I, I've had these developers from New York say, well, we, got it. we need to take the height limit off in DC. I was totally opposed to that. Uh, you know, to have, have the 100 story pencil condos in New York reduced housing prices there? No, because they're selling them all from $7 million to $92 million. And none of those projects are more than 5% occupied ever because the people who own them live in Moscow and Mexico and Morocco and you name it. But anyway, so what I would say is that communities need a kinder, gentler approach to density, which is what we used to do in the old days. So you might have a garage apartment, which is what we used to call like a mother-in-law suite, you know? You know or, and, and the way you do that right is you're really strict on design, okay? You might have duplexes, but you don't have, you know, but the, the old-timey duplexes before World War II, where you couldn't tell the difference between the duplex and the single-family house because it was so beautifully designed. So, or you might have a small four-unit apartment. My house in Tacoma Park was a four-unit apartment built by the B&O Railroad for railroad workers because the B&O station used to be right where the Tacoma Park Metro is now. And I bought it legally severed it and turned my side, which was an upstairs apartment down, into a single family house. But you could, it looks on the outside just like a house, but it was four apartments. So you could do those kind of things and that's how you address affordability. That's how you keep old people and young people together. You have a diversity of things, but you, but you have to have good design or people start to think, oh, you know, it's like, there's a great project. I want you to go home and Google this project. It's called uh, the Cotton District in Starkville, Mississippi. Now this kind of blew my mind. So Starkville, Mississippi was this kind of, you know, it's where Mississippi State University is. And there's this guy named Dan Camp. He had never heard of new urbanism. But what he thought was, he taught, he taught math at Mississippi State, but he couldn't understand why student, off-campus student apartments were always the crappiest garden of Harvard you ever saw. And he, kept, and what, he had this idea that like, well, why can't housing for students look like, you know, the, the beautiful old Mississippi housing like from Natchez or from New Orleans. So he goes and he builds a little four unit apartment that looks like it's right off the streets of the French Quarter. And you know, these parents come there and all of a sudden they go, oh, I want my kids to pay, live there. And they're willing to pay a little more per square foot than the crappy garden apartments. Well, guess what? The guy has redeveloped 22 blocks of the city now. He's the mayor of Starkville. <laughs> And, you know, it's just like, it's kind of like just thinking like common sense. I met another guy. So let's just talk about, you know, downtown living. So I was in, uh, I gave a talk at Cornell last fall. And this guy walks up to me after my talk. His name is Rick Hauser. He's an architect. He lives in the town of Perry, New York. It's a small town about halfway between Buffalo and Rochester. Now, upstate New York, if you know Buffalo, is a beautiful place, but very economically challenged. So he... Uh, he, he has an architecture practice. All his clients are in Rochester or Buffalo. And he decides he wants to have, his wife is from this little town, Perry, New York. He decides he wants to have his office in downtown Perry because it's a really sweet little main street and half the buildings are empty. So he figures he can have no problem renting space. But here's what happens. He goes to the owner of the nicest building in downtown, which is vacant, and says, I'd like to lease some space from you. And the guy says, no, I can't lease any space because I'd have to fix my roof. And that would cost me like $50,000, whatever. And then he goes to another guy and says, I'd like to lease some space from you. And this guy says, no, I can't lease space. I have to rewire the building. Now, these are people who do not understand the difference between spending and investment, right? Mm -hmm. So what does he do? He sets up a little for-profit company, calls it Perry Main Street LLC. You can actually Google this and you'll get a PowerPoint by this guy, Perry Main Street LLC. And then he goes around and sells shares to all his friends. And the shares could be not just cash, but they could be in kind. So the drywall guy is an investor and the plumber is an investor. They raise $200,000 and they buy a downtown building and they restore it. And he puts his office on the first floor, gets another guy to move in next to him. And then he does something that has never been done in this town, ever. He puts three apartments upstairs. And as he says, they leased up overnight because no one had built any housing in this town except like subdivision houses and cornfields for like 40 years. And he's now, he's now done seven buildings and he's the mayor of that town. <laughs> and his, his comment to me was there is a pent up demand for walkable small town living everywhere in America. It's just not being met in many places because we're just ignoring like our upper stories above these old stores and things.
I mean, I don't know what the case is here, but there's so many towns like that where they couldn't get a bank loan. I have another friend, Julian Price, who, who developed the first downtown housing project in Asheville, North Carolina. He has a bookstore on the first floor called Malaprop's Bookstore. He has three floors of housing above it. He couldn't get a loan from any bank in Asheville. People kept saying, nobody wants to live in downtown Asheville. Well, has anybody here been to downtown Asheville recently? I mean, th this is, you know, thinking about the future. Yes, ma'am. Well, the far on the farming communities, the, most of those places, the residents aren't doing the farming. So they actually have a real... The, the, so they usually have a, like a, actually a farmer who actually knows what they're doing. But I've actually, when I was in Arkansas a couple weeks ago, I saw a, just a small apartment that had a community garden that was maintained by the, like the maintenance guy there. And they had all kinds of, you know, had arugula and had some, you know, stuff you put in your salads and spices. And all the, the residents just, love, they just got and pick it. But what, they, what the builder said to me, the, he said, it's not so much about the food, it's about the idea of building a sense of community. And when people kind of come out together around something like a community garden, they get to know their neighbors more. And they also, when you actually, the one thing about walkability, not everybody's gonna walk for things, but when you make it easy to walk, it's kind of the, all the, I was at uh, the Hopkins Public uh, School of Public Health, and they have this idea, they say, you need to make the healthy choice the easy choice, so the, the default choice, so you don't even think about it. So let me give an example. So most new office buildings until about five years ago, the first thing you always saw was the elevator, right? And the stairwell was always behind a fire door, like in a closet. So nobody would walk up and down the stairs. Now they're having, building, they're, they're changing that whole thing. They're making the stairway very attractive. It's the first thing you see. It's all lighted up. I was down in a new building in Nashville, and when you walk up down the stairs, it plays music. As soon as you, you know, and people were like walking up the stairs and walking down the stairs and walking up the stairs. And, and the idea was, is it, you know, these are things you don't even have to think about. So if you, if you make a community where walking is just easier, people will start to walk more. And so it's all of those kind of things that sort of make the, the healthy choice the easy choice. Yes, ma'am. Great question and good segue. Um, you know, the opportunity presented itself for us to work with the community on this property and, and we jumped at that because we've been looking at this property for decades and, and pursuing it as an important part of the town of Centerville. So at this point we know that we're going to work with the community and develop a vision but a, a part of our process over the next few months will be working with different um, potential implementers to hopefully identify someone that can take a vision we put together with the community and then carry that forward that has the expertise to move a development forward. Sure. Um, so, you know, baseline, we're gathering community input and having conversations around innovative uses for the site. A part of that process is also bringing in the necessary professionals in design and planning and development and all of these different areas to help evaluate and figure out how we continue to move this forward and what those next steps look like. And, and there are a lot of probably there are probably a number of different ways you could develop that project that would be better than your standard suburban kind of thing, and and there are a lot of designers who do this kind of thing who are very good at th this kind of stuff. I mean, and you know, they're probably you probably want to set some principles in, that behind your development agreement. You want to have some things in there. For example, do you want the, do you, do you, would you prefer to have the land along the river? preserved or you would rather have the houses back up on the river i think you'd probably rather have the land along the river preserved right that would be like a principle for example do you want to have every inch of the land in house lots and streets or do you want to have some parks and some green space in there and maybe or maybe some a small gardens or something so that might be another principle do you want to have like super wide streets or a little narrower streets by the way in the wider the streets are, the more expensive they are, the faster the cars go, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, narrow streets, good for business, good for the environment, good for the community. I mean, things like that. So, and there are people who can actually lay out some of those scenarios. And I just, let me just tell you one little story about this. So a, a friend of mine is, is a guy named Joe Riley, who's the former mayor of Charleston, South Carolina. He was the mayor for 10 four-year terms. Ooh. Okay, <laughs> longest serving mayor in American history. And if you go to Charleston, South Carolina, there are two rivers there, the Ashley River and the Cooper River. And the Cooper River was the industrial waterfront of Charleston, right? And 
like everywhere else, you know, the, you know, the, the, all the industry left, and they actually had these vacant warehouses, and industrial sites, and so forth. And this was before Charleston became sort of the hot place it is today. So these uh, these developers came in with this proposal to put a couple of high-rise condo towers, like right on the river. And all the economic development people were really excited about this because nobody had come in with any other proposals, right? So they go to the mayor and say, oh, we're going we're gonna to build these 20-story condos. It's very exciting. We can take this land and, you know, put it back in productive use. And the mayor, Joe Riley, was a really clever guy. He said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to give the best of the city to everyone. They go, what are you talking about? And he goes, we're going to build parks along those rivers. And, and they did, world-class parks. And guess what? You know where the most valuable land in all of South Carolina is today? The land next to those parks. And everyone can actually get to the river, see the river, use the river, and the value goes way back into the city. If you had just built two high-rise condos, then it would only be, they would be valued, but nothing, nobody else, you would have destroyed the single greatest asset in the city, which was public access to the water. And so it's thinking about things like that that I think can help you. And, and, and then whatever your development agreement is, you, you get somebody who will actually adhere to it. And you just, if they won't, you just tell them, go away. And when you, and, and people, are, that's the pro, people are afraid to do that. Now, let me give you an example. So Southern Pines, North Carolina, it's a big golf place down in North Carolina. So many years, they had passed a tree ordinance many years ago. You got to save large trees in the parking lots of shopping centers, basically what it was. And after, about a couple weeks after they pass this ordinance, Walmart comes in, says we want to build a Walmart store, and the, and the city tells them about their tree ordinance, and they go, well, we can't do that. And, and they go, well, you, you can either have low prices or lots of trees, you can't have both. <laughs> and, you know, in most places would have just said, oh, fine, cut down all the trees, and then everybody would have cut down the trees, and, and it would have been, you know, a mess. So Southern Pine said no to Walmart. Walmart left. Target shows up two weeks later and says, we'll build a store and we'll save the trees. <coughs> Ten years later, Walmart begged to come back. And of course, they would follow the tree ordinance because they set a standard. When you set a higher standard, you start going a different direction. Then when you, you can either go up, you can go down. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is, you know, a, a pessimist sees opportunity, sees difficulty in every opportunity. An optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. And if I'm not mistaken, this is a community of optimists. So I wish you well, and uh, thanks for coming out uh, tonight. So a heartfelt thank you to Ed McMahon for joining us today. Do we have another question? Yes. Sure. Sure. So we did a, a front porch conversation on, on June 3rd. We'll be doing two more in June, um, Friday, June 17th, and Friday, June 24th from 3 to 6 p.m. We'll be out on the, the front lawn with some games and cookies, and we want uh, the community to come out and talk with us. We're bringing on some planning and design expertise to help us start filtering through the community input we are receiving, and we will be in touch in the next couple weeks with what the plan looks like moving forward through July, August, and September as well. Sure, we have an option contract to purchase the properties through September 23rd, and an option to purchase. Sure, and we are figuring that out. I mean, we started Baseline. We work from a place of transparency and public process in, in all of the work that we do at ESLC because that's an important integral part of, of who we are as an organization. You know, so we wanted to start out and talk with the community and see how our project was then directed. If we immediately hit opposition and the, the town elected officials weren't interested in working with us and the community says we have a plan and we're happy with it, then we would have chosen a different path. So it's going to be evolving. It's a, it's a living, breathing process in many ways. Sure, that is uh, one way in which it could move forward if we create a plan with the community and we are able to identify an implementer or developer or some entity that has the expertise to continue moving that forward, um, that's certainly a path. I never leave a Ed McMahon interaction of, of any type, whether conversation or in person, not feeling inspired. And I, I really hope that everyone here connected in some way with his message and something that he said. And we have a number of exercises, though. I, I know that your time is precious and you've already um, given us two hours to gather input and initiate conversations about how 
what uses at Chesterfield can support a vibrant Centerville. Um, so certainly feel free to stick around and talk with us and share some of that input, but we'll also carry the same opportunities forward into our Friday conversations on the 17th and the 24th if you're not able to, to stay with us this evening. Okay, all right, thank you.